All right. Good morning. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us for lecture three. Um, lecture three is Borders, Migration, and Art, the U.S.-Mexico Experience. It's going to be a lecture and Q&A led by Dr. Gilberto Cárdenas. And I will be taking and facilitating questions throughout the, throughout the lecture. This is also on Facebook Live, um, and we'll also be taking questions from there. And so without further ado, Dr. George Vargas, take it away. Bienvenidos. Welcome. My name is Dr. George Vargas, curator and director of programs at Mexicata Museum in Austin, Texas. Today, we present the third lecture in the virtual lecture series dedicated to life and experiences in the U.S.-Mexico borderlands, which examines the cultural history and social issues as portrayed by artists in the El Paso, Juarez, and the U.S.-Mexico border region. In 2019, Mr. Juan Antonio Sandoval Jr. donated his wonderful collection of art and books to the museum. The current exhibition Mexico, The Border and Beyond features selections from the Juan Sandoval collection and is on view until August 22nd. A large part of the exhibition is life and experiences in the U.S. Mexico borderlands, which is, is, which is divided into five regions or five sections, excuse me. Five scholars each will examine a theme. Before we continue, we would like to invite our viewing audience to make comments and direct questions at our lecture who will respond to them afterwards. Without further ado, the museum proudly presents, I am immigrant, you are, borders, migration and art the U.S.-Mexico Experience, a lecture by Dr. Gilberto Cárdenas. Dr. Cárdenas was the executive director of the University of Notre Dame Center for Arts and Culture and the founder and director of the Institute for Latino Studies at Notre Dame. He also was assistant provost at the university. He held the Julian Zamora Chair in Latino studies at that time. Dr. Cárdenas was a full professor and has an outstanding publication record as well. His research interests include immigration, race and ethnic relations, Latinx art and culture, and visual sociology. He also established and owned Galeria Sin Fronteras an art gallery in Austin, Texas, featuring Chicano and Latinx artists. He is an avid collector of Latinx art and was a close friend of Mr. Juan Antonio Sandoval Jr., whose collection is represented in our exhibition. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Dr. Gilberto Cárdenas. Okay, thank you. Thank you, George. I um, want to begin my presentation with a short introduction, drawing attention to the exhibition of Mich at Mexicarte in the collection of Juan Sandoval and my personal connection to Juan. Uh, I've known Juan for, for a long time. We will, I will cover the origins of my interest in photography and art, followed by the evolution of my collection of Latino art, beginning with my involvement with others in advancing social change and social justice for Chicanos. With, with, arts, with Juan's collection, you know, it makes me reflect in my collection on migration and borders. I provide a summary of research on migration that I conducted during the time I was uh, a student at Notre Dame and thereafter uh, with attention to the visual story of migration provided by the artist as well. The artwork in my art collection often overlap with the works of Juan's collection and that, that are currently on display at Mexicarte. And that's really what uh, drove me to the idea of, of really a reflection. Uh, I will share my works from the collection, drawing on projects that I got involved with through my commercial art gallery in Austin, Texas, Galeria Sin Fronteras, um, 
working in conjunction also with the Colegio de la Frontera Norte in Tijuana, Cell Phone Graphics in Los Angeles with various art centers around the country and with artist collectives um, and later with Consejo Nacional, uh, de Consejo Nacional uh, Gráfico. In developing artwork uh, pertaining to borders, uh, we did big projects in Tijuana with Amelia Malagamba, Talleres de la Frontera Norte, uh, 1982 to 1996. This artwork was exhibited in Mexico and throughout the United States, and often accompanied with catalogs, publications, and related public events. I will take this opportunity to share works from the Gilberto Cardenas and Dolores Garcia collection of Latino art pertaining to migration and borders that have been shown in museums at the Snipe Museum of Art, for example, at the University of Notre Dame, uh, the National Museum of Mexican Art uh, in Chicago, San Diego State Art Museum, Museum of Art, the Blanton Museum of Art in Austin, Texas, and monoprints created by the Global Midwest Project at, at the Notre Dame Center for Arts and Culture. I believe that Juan and I share experiences in collecting art and our willingness to share art with, from our collections with our community and the general public. And I think this is important too, because looking at Juan's work, it reminds me of other collectors as well who have shared their work uh, with publicly uh, and, and have also done a lot of work like Ricardo Romo, uh, Armando Duron, Ricardo Romo in San Antonio, Armando Duron in Los Angeles area, and many other collectors uh, who have made a real strong interest in donations and collecting. Dolores and I have donated a tremendous amount of, from our collection to the museums I just mentioned uh, and to many nonprofit organizations. Uh, for example, MALDEF, the national headquarters, it's a great body of work there and to the regional offices. And just for one other example, it would be La Casa de Amistad in South Bend, Indiana. It's a great pleasure to be part of the series at Mexicarte, uh, held in conjunction with this current exhibition, Mexico, the Borders and Beyond, selection from the Juan Sandoval Junior Collection. I join my friends and colleagues in expressing gratitude to Juan, uh, un amigo and friend and art collector. Uh, Juan's donation to the Mexicarte Museum of over 1700 works of art was extremely generous. Juan and I go back decades as friends collecting art and Juan being a supporter and customer of my commercial art gallery in Austin. These works were primarily purchased at conferences and community events that we both attended over the years. I extend my appreciation to George Vargas for curating this exhibit and to his assistance for the planning and all the related programming, gracias. I encourage everyone to visit Mexicarte to view the exhibition of Juan's collection in my opinion, the artwork provide, provided by Juan is priceless. The exhibit is very well organized and as a result, very engaging. The organization of this exhibit into diverse sections, particularly in the section entitled, I am an immigrant, you are, life experiences in the US-Mexico borderlands has inspired me to reflect on research on migration beginning in the 1960s, late 1960s, and and going to about 2017. My work focused on the border and the greater border region uh, on, the, on the territorial migration and circulation of Mexicans throughout the United States, including return and forced movement back to Mexico by Mexican workers. I will begin by sharing photographs from this early period and then moving to Mexican migration. You can see on these images here, uh, these were done, the first one on the top is the Crusade for Justice, uh, Migrasa Primero Conference, where we took a march to the Capitol uh, in, in support of the farm workers. And then when I was at Notre Dame, I came back after the first year and, to, and photographed the Chicano Moratorium. Uh, got up real close and we we're going back and forth with a lot of police and a lot of activity. I'm particularly pleased that the work at Mexicarte except from Juan's collection, overlaps with our, our work as well, including works that I will cover in this presentation. Uh, as I mentioned, I grew up in Los Angeles and San Gabriel, 
uh, which actually San Gabriel preceded the formation of the city of Los Angeles, the King of Spain ordered a procession to, to establish the Plaza de, in, in Los Angeles. Uh, when I was a student at MASA, we started MASA, the Mexican American Student Association, uh, at East LA College, as a bad boy in high school, I had to go to junior college and then transferred to Cal State LA, where we started UMAS, United Mexican American Students, and then it became Mecha as I left. Uh, I moved in 1969 to Notre Dame to go to graduate school. My professor, Ralph Guzman, uh, told me about a professor at Notre Dame, Julian Zamora, uh, who had a grant from the Ford Foundation to study the border and the migration. And he, Ralph really encouraged me to proceed. And I'm really grateful that he did that. And very grateful that Julian Zamora accepted me into the sociology department. I got my master's and PhD. I'm not going to go a lot into that. Uh, I've got a couple images here, one with Paul Schuster Taylor, a great labor economist who married to Dorothea Lang. Uh, he came to Notre Dame. And when I taught at Berkeley as a visiting professor, we often got together uh, for lunch or just to chat. And Barbara Driscoll, who uh, did publish a book on Braceros, a historian. That time was a long haired, crazy hippie. And you can see below too, uh, we were able to be interviewed at first Tuesday, the few of us that were at Notre Dame at the time, uh, Delfina Landeros, a great friend and, and student who just recently passed last year and others. Uh, this is the first television program of its sort to, to do these kinds of uh, hour long programs. Dr. Somoto received a grant from the Ford Foundation as I mentioned uh, to study the entire border region and he gained assistance of several scholars, including labor economist Ernesto Galarza. I was fortunate <clears throat> to be part of this team along with Jorge Bustamante. I want to comment also about Jorge. He just passed two weeks ago. He was a very close friend of mine <clears throat> and a great leader, a founder also of the Colegio de la Frontera Norte in Tijuana, Mexico, and an advocate for migrant rights in the past 50 years. He not only just advocate for migrant rights, in the, US, in the Western Hemisphere, but throughout the world, when he worked with the United Nations on a commission, or, uh, and really grateful to for his friendship and to all the tremendous work that he did, uh, and the number of people I was able to work with over the years. At that time, Jorge and I and Dr. Samara were also interested in the methodologies that would gain full insight into the complexities of the migration process. Again, this is 1969. There wasn't a whole lot of attention. We weren't the first, but that was the beginning of a long period that continues to the present. Um, we utilized and looked at the validity or the reliability or the utility of direct observation, the use of interviews, participant observation, uh, ethical questions about interviewing uh, detained migrants and prisoners. Uh, we did visits to the Border Patrol training station at Port Isabel. Survey, we conducted survey research strategies later. Uh, we, we were locating and using archival data, including the availability of government records and the availability of secondary sources, all of which we were able to utilize in our research. We did the, one of the first time series, reliable time series uh, that we put together, believe it or not. Uh, these were in different publications. There was no consistency. The definitions of migrant change and entrance and deportations. So we had to put it all together for legal, undocumented, and temporary worker migration. We we're able to meet with high-level officials, of the Immigration Service, as a key, as well as key politicians at the time, testifying before the Rodino Committee hearings in in Chicago. I want to say 1970. I can't remember the exact date. Uh, where he introduced legislation to penalize employers for hiring undocumented immigrants. Uh, and that led to a long debate. That legislation got changed and, by, and became the Sinsa Mazzoli law that got passed in 1986, uh, that included amnesty and things of that sort. Uh, we fought with the, the committee, uh, the House Judiciary Subcommittee on, on the Immigration when we had our meetings in Chicago at the hearings. Uh, we blamed the Congress and not the immigrants for the problem. So let me move on to some of our findings. Uh, and here, in, in this is the connection between my research and the, the art, uh, where I took an interest in documentary photography and began <clears throat> working with like a, a, the uh, Centro 
micro center in South Bend. And we went to, to Northern Indiana, uh, in various places. We went to uh, other counties in Indiana, uh, Southern Indiana. We went into Southern Michigan as well and took photographs of labor camps. This is in Southern Indi in Northern Indiana. I uh, really dilapidated camps that were not uh, very, very good. Uh, and our work on the border, I did a lot of photography. I'm just showing a few examples here. Uh, and then we published work too. And this is a Sun Journal that came out actually in 1976, but the images were taken earlier of activity in South Bend, people promoting farm workers and immigrants, uh, marches that we conducted uh, and, and um, plays and some artwork. I, I had edited that volume for UCLA Sun Journal. So let me go now to the historical antecedents. You can see that a great part of the United States at one time was Mexico. Uh, this land was taken from Mexicans and became part of the United States through two different time periods. So the Texas Revolution, they call it, and then the US-Mexico War. Um, so these historical origins, we have Mexican society and culture still continue to be a fundamental culture of the United States, the American experience, just by its timing. In fact, the, the territorial uh, beginnings of the United States. The Mexican experience in American society is fundamental to the understanding of Mexican migration since the advent of the large scale migration that began in the 1910s. The origins of US migration policy toward Mexico stems from this important social relation that preceded migration. We don't have time to get into that, but I wanted to just mention that, that it's really critical that because of these wars, uh, there's not a question of ethnic relations and, and identity. This is the question of transfer of land, transfer of people, transfer of societies, and then the imposition of the, the dominant society over, I'm sorry, the minority society in that Southwest over the majority of the people there in various places uh, throughout the Southwest. The immigration problem today facing our country has a direct connection to this historical process. Again, we can't go through that, but here we can see an artist here, which I stuck in front here, this is done later, uh, by Yolanda Lopez, uh, and then this idea of coming across the, from Europe to the Western Hemisphere. Mexicans have the longest and most continuous flows of migration to the United States, particularly from 1900 to the present. We had out migration earlier, people leaving the US to, to go back to Mexico when they couldn't stand living in the living conditions that they had to endure. The most distinctive and most important feature of the Mexican migration experience in our research was labor migration, which stands in contrast to US immigration, the US immigration experience of all other immigrants from throughout the world, with the exception that we are witnessing today regarding Central America, South America, and the Caribe. With significant exceptions throughout this time, the primary experience for most other immigrants has been legal immigration for purpose of settlement. Legal immigration for purpose of settlement. The Dillingham Commission got started in 1908 and went through 1910. It's a government commission. Uh, this is where the federal government took an interest in looking at European immigration and the need to control it. There, again, there's too much fear that too many immigrants are coming from Southern and Eastern Europe and over and outsizing the number that came in earlier from Northern and Western Europe. Uh, their findings, they didn't really look at Mexicans, just very short, couple pages, their conclusion. In the case of Mexicans, they are desirable as workers, but not settlers. And this became the basis of US immigration policy. And I wanna say even by default to the present. Congressman Box from the state of Texas on the floor of the Congress, so you can look it up in the congressional hearings. Mexicans were ignorant, be honest, be honest. illiterate, often diseased and vicious, unskilled and undesirable. And that happened all before the big immigration law of 1917. Here, during our research, we were able to photograph from the border area, uh, in various places, I'm just giving you two examples, one in South Texas on the top and the bottom, uh, and Ciudad Juarez, just south of uh, Juarez. I'm sorry, it's just south of the bustle. <laughs> okay. So that's why I call it Mexican migration being distinctive. Unlike European immigration migration from most of the world, 
the dominant feature of Mexican migration has been temporary labor migration. It's not just labor migration, we're talking temporary labor migration, labor circulation between Mexico and the United States, and undocumented migration as well from the very beginning to the present. Undocumented immigrants are blamed for social problems, unemployment, deindustrialization, rising crime, housing problems, poverty, rising health costs, cost of education, drain on the economy, and a whole range of things uh, as a, really as a scapegoat. Uh, they are defined to be illegal uh, as, as, and this to be the, the, the singular cause of the immigration problem uh, viewed from our government. Reliance on criminalization has strengthened the underground system by forcing the flow of migrant workers who depend on it and continues to have a firm, firmer grip on the migration process. So the, if the primary response to you have a high demand, high use and high profitability of immigrant labor, and you have them coming in temporarily, even when you don't allow them in te temporarily through the legal purpose, they come in uh, when that's over because they have the workers still have the same needs, the employers still have the same needs, and that underground system has developed. We have smugglers, coyotes, and other processes for transportation uh, where the process continues. Yet scapegoating and defining, I had this double, reliance on criminalization has strengthened the underground system by, am I repeating myself, sorry. Okay, so Texas, here's some, some images that I took when we were at the border. Um, let me jump forward now to the conclusion. The best solution to undocumented migration is legal migration. And there are a variety of ways to do this. We don't have time to get into the details, but people can do this in their countries of origin. Uh, if you, the State Department has a lot of discretionary authority and we'll get into how they use it in the wrong ways in the past and they continue to use it in the present, but that can change. We have DACA, a whole lot of other things, which I won't actually cover at this point. Both President Reagan and President Bush understood the benefits of this approach and brought it to, they brought to the nation. Reagan signed the Immigration Control Act in 1986 which provided for amnesty and other features. President Bush put immigration as a high priority, but 9-11 changed everything during this period. It was impossible to address the immigration problem. Uh, and he wanted a comprehensive immigration solution. Let's move to the present, uh, getting closer to the present at least, uh, the, uh, the US-Mexico border. I do want to comment though about uh, the efforts of Latinos to work across the borders and Mexicanos too. Uh, to be in solidarity, to protect the interests of migrant workers, immigrant workers, uh, and workers in both countries. And this is Bert Corona speaking uh, at the UNAM in Mexico City in 1972. And now turning back to art here, we have a variety of ways that we could look at collectors. Uh, many collectors are involved the way I've been involved uh, in my case, as a photographer and, and scholar, but also, you know, having an interest in creating spaces, uh, in my case, commercial art gallery, donating artwork to museums, lending works for exhibitions. Uh, so Juan has been very gracious about this, as other collectors, uh, helping produce publications, reports, working with artists to do limited edition, prints and portfolios, uh, lecturing, doing interviews, uh, showcasing, like, as I mentioned, in art spaces, uh, underwriting work for projects, commissioning artists to do murals and other artwork, uh, teaching about art. In my case, you know, my area is international migration and demography, but I had a strong interest in art, so I taught a course on Latino art. Um, and after I joined, the Texas faculty in 19, actually this is for the gallery, but I uh, went to the faculty in 1975 to uh, the University of Texas at Austin and began teaching there. Uh, later opened up an art gallery in 1986, Galeria Sin Fronteras, which I mentioned, and this is the, some of the work that we had created uh, in front of the building. Our first show was Jose Trevino uh, in 1986. It's a really wonderful opening exhibition. Very really grateful we did this original print. Uh, and then as the years went on in the gallery, uh, met artists and artists that we worked most closely with over the years, and many artists that we worked closely with, 
this case here, Malakias Montoya. We commissioned him to do a series of prints uh, later uh, on migration. Uh, and he did that. And then later he did a big painting, which is in our living room here. You can see the pulse from, <laughs> from the curtain uh, still there. Um, but really beautiful work that uh, that was circulated around the country and donated to museums. Byron Broccoli, uh, who's in Mexico, he has a print studio there, but he was a graduate student here, was on his MFA uh, thesis committee. And he showed at the gallery and we also did portfolio work with him and other projects uh, later. Uh, it, with Amelia Malagamba and the silkscreen project we did in Tijuana and so with self-help graphics, a lot of work was uh, created to show uh, life on the border and different things here. Patsy Valdez does this work here for LA TJ. Uh, and again, the idea at the bottom, crossing the border and then making their way to LA and becoming part of the society. Some of the publications here through the Taya de la Frontera project that Amelia had organized in, we collaborated with the Galerias and Fronteras. Uh, we're, we're shown at SECUT, the Centro Cultural Tijuana. Um, and we had um, really, really beautiful exhibitions. A lot of artists participated over the years. Uh, these works circulated and traveled throughout Mexico and the United States. Uh, here we have an image of Malakis Montoya, uh, mono prints, talleres that we did later. Uh, beautiful, beautiful catalog. With featuring a lot of artists from Mexico and the US. Uh, and then <clears throat> other work during this period of time uh, were loaned to the, from, from the Blanton Museum, we gave them a long-term loan and then they loaned work to the Museo de Barrio, uh, pressing the point of beautiful exhibition of Chicano art prints from 1970s and, and Puerto Rican artists. So they had two groups of exhibits, a really, really beautiful show and catalog. And then later, when I went back to Notre Dame, uh, work was borrowed for a show at St. Mary's College, uh, right across the street from Notre Dame in, <clears throat> in 2000. <coughs> a little bit earlier, when I was still here in, in Austin, we had uh, Pedacito de Mi Corazón, a show of Carmen Lomas Garza, who, who we featured twice for one-person shows and worked with the, the uh, Austin Museum of Art to uh, contact Carmen to do a traveling a show in, in here and then to travel. Juan Sandoval's work is from this portfolio is featured. He, he had the entire uh, portfolio, real pleased. Back in well, 1986, Sister Karen Bocalero, who was director, honey director of self help graphics in LA, asked me to help her try to raise money to create an etching studio. Uh, I didn't really know where to get a grant, so I suggested that we get private donors to help subsidize the production of a etching portfolio, which we were successful in accomplishing. Uh, to, <clears throat> some prints were done in 86, 87. We secured the support of the artists that you see on the screen here uh, to, do, to work with a master printer to do a plate. And then we sent the plates, the ink, and the paper to Mexico City to the brother of Alejandro Romero to create the prints. And then I went down and brought them back to the United States and distributed them uh, to self graphics. And we came portfolios as well as co-publishers. Um, here we have just one print of each artist that I'm gonna showcase here. Um, Guillermo Bert, Alejandro Romero. Uh, you can see the border patrol, you know, hitting immigrants. Uh, you can look at it as protecting their borders if you want to look at it that way, or you can look at it from the standpoint of the immigrants who are, uh, you know, viewed as harming the border, even though they were not. They were trying to survive and meet the demands of employers and feed the families at home. The place of residence in Mexico, place of work in the U.S., they became dependent on that and they had to continue working whether we wanted them to in, enter or not. Malakias Montoya. A feature of his work often is using barbed wire, the American flag, the maguey plant in terms of the strength of, of the migrant community, the immigrant community, and the places where they live. Um, we hear Jose Antonio Aguirre, the 200th anniversary of the United States is being celebrated at the time. That same period of time, a number of immigrants, I forgot to, to check to see how many, uh, I'm going to say 20, suffocated in, in a railroad boxcar. Uh, 
Uh, you can see the, the uh, Statue of Liberty there, and then the ghosts, the images of people, uh, beautiful print. Jose Antonio went to the Art Institute in Chicago, and I met him here in Austin. He overstayed his visa and came undocumented, moved to LA. Unfortunately, everything's all cleared up, and he is very active in, in Los Angeles and continuing to do wonderful work. Leo Limon, an artist from Los Angeles as well, uh, did this depicting the situation of Mexicans, uh, the disenfranchised in Mexico, uh, whose vote didn't count in Mexico often, uh, and then in the United States where they didn't have the right to vote. But, you know, again, living in both places, trying to, to keep their lives and their families uh, supportive. Uh, and then I went back to Notre Dame. I got uh, recruited to be assistant provost and to start the Institute for Latino Studies. At the Institute we created in 1999, the Galeria America, we called it Galeria America at Notre Dame. Our first show was Jean Charlot from the Stations of the Cross was I was fortunate to purchase from his widow in Hawaii, um, a series of, of etchings. I say that because Jean Charlot, in my opinion, is really a great influence on me. He um, came from, from Spain after World War I, uh, went to Mexico, began to really take an interest in Mexican art, uh, especially Posada. He, uh, I'm not saying he discovered Posada, but he treated Posada as more as a serious artist than just a cartoonist. Um, and he argued th this notion, which I always believed in, art for the people. For prints had that ability, if they were made for, for people to look at that were affected by their work, by, by the artist's work, that they would pay attention to it. And Art for the People, something to me was always resonated very strongly with me. And I'm glad that we had our first exhibition of his work there. He was very Catholic and actually did an a, a internship, not an internship, he was a visitor, re, visiting artist in, at, at Notre Dame back in the 50s uh, at the Institute for Latino Studies and through the Galeria America at Notre Dame and other ways, we featured shows. I think our first show there was uh, one of the first shows with Fernando Salicrup, who I have to say, a great friend, one of the founders of, of the Taller de Boricua in New York. Uh, he created this uh, portfolio to, to showcase his digital work uh, when he came to, to have the exhibition at Notre Dame. Malakias Montoya was a visiting professor twice with us, and, and he and his wife put the show together, and then we assisted in the publication. And, uh, of Montoya on the death penalty. Um, very, very nice show. It traveled in various places throughout the United States as well as other work of his that has traveled. Uh, and years later, uh, Amelia Malagamba uh, really pressed us to do a show on migration. Uh, long story short, we got a grant from the Rockefeller Foundation uh, to present a show at the Snipe Museum. Snipe Museum Art also supported very strongly and created the Caras Vemos exhibit. Uh, you can see the people who contributed to that in terms of essays. The exhibit traveled to Wisconsin, to the Father Museum in, in UCLA, to the uh, space in, in San Antonio, um, the Centro de Cultura, San Antonio. Um, in 1986, this is when the big demonstrations were held in Chicago, in Los Angeles, in New York, and in various parts of the country uh, in support of immigrant workers. Here's some images from the show. In the front here, the blue image of the worker that actually came out on the top cover of the Notre Dame magazine to all the alumni. Uh, they're very proud that it was on this uh, alumni uh, journal. This is Maceo Montoya, the son of Malaki Montoya. You can see a piece of artwork that's in the back there um, from Malaki S2 on the, on the right side. Uh, I'm sorry about this the image is not good, but cutting out his men, they did a installation of the Ibiza and the Guadalupe blooper that was projected. And then below, there was actually a, a, a like a pond that a water with names of, of immigrants who, who died, um, who were being transported illegally. And then I think the, in Victoria, Texas. Uh, and so the, their names are floating in the water, the 21 people who died in that tremendous installation. 
And here works from Dulce Pinzon, artist of Mexico who lived in New York at the time and was really trying to address the productivity of immigrant workers and how they're not viewed as either not recognized in terms of the indispensability of Mexican labor, whether it be in people's homes or, or helping them do their laundry and things of that sort or transporting in cars as chauffeurs or delivering food. So this was featured in the exhibition as well that I made you selected. She selected all the work. I had very little input on that. She didn't let me do that. <laughs> So we have Malakis Montoya for an exhibition at the Galerias Sin Fronteras um, back in 1992 that I'm showing here. Uh, again, at de dealing with the Crescent Cristobal Solon, Colon, um, very strong image. This was uh, featured at the Jewish Museum recently in New York. Uh, works by Lalo Alcaraz. Uh, after I was no longer director of the Institute for Latino Studies, a show that was organized there featured his work in a beautiful exhibition. I had purchased this one a long time back uh, on the Migra Mouse. So you see artists who were able to really develop a lot of interesting ways to address the migration issue. Uh, it's an installation done by Marilena Castro. Uh, it, she needed to go to the National Museum of Mexican Art to do a show. Uh, she didn't have support. We were able to provide support for her as long as she gave presentations in Chicago to children. And so she was able to have the installation at the museum. She later uh, offered to, me to purchase the installation, which I did, and we were able to feature it in this show. We could not travel this because it was too fragile. Uh, we had artists, Artemio Rodriguez, uh, Poli Marichal, Silvia Capistran, do the gigantic print. They did, actually, they, I believe they did this in, in Puerto Rico, where Poli's from. And, it is very large prints, uh, a series of prints, but that were mural prints, yes. And again, here undocumented on the right side, really important piece of work. One of the first purchases I did from Malakias Montoya, an image of his of a painting from his son, who's now uh, going up to full professor at UC Davis. Um, he's a very uh, prolific writer, a poet, and just amazing, well, not poet, I'm sorry, essayist. Here, Delilah Montoya depicting, in this image, she's a photographer, depicting a person crossing the border with the Virgen de Guadalupe in her back. Again, the maguey on, on the floor there and the dryness of the areas where they're crossing. And then uh, Amelia also picked Aggie got her green card. Um, it's part of the show by Isabel Martinez. Uh, this is a bad, bad image, but this is one of the monoprints that Malakias did during the uh, Talleres de Monotipia uh, that was organized at Colef. And also the ex votos. Um, again, for prayers are made for people who have passed or to protect people crossing. There's been a lot of imagery. Uh, that way, there's some nice catalogs by colleagues who have created some really beautiful catalogs uh, depicting this and explaining to the public why this happened and who did this work. Uh, again, a better, more focus image on Yolanda. Uh, she came up to Notre Dame for a visit and I had her sign this print. We did, again, the part of the series of migration series that uh, we were able to get contracted for Malakis Montoya. Here's an artist, Antonia Guerrero, whose father was a real famous Mexican artist, and she lived in New York, and her work is this charcoal painting, which I'm very proud that we were able to secure it. Later, the National Museum of Mexican Art decided to do an exhibit from our collection. We had donated over 2,200 works to the museum, and they got a, a, a new image of the, um, the sign. Uh, and they named the gallery a permanent space at the National Museum in the Gilberto and Dolores Garcia uh, Gallery. Um, and then there's one area in the gallery where they constantly rotated works, posters, prints, seriographs, etchings, lithographs, etc., from their collection. And then they show other work in other parts of that space as well. They have numerous spaces throughout the museum. It's a really great museum, and I'm really uh, glad that I was able to be on their board for a number of years, years past. 
This is the beautiful work that we commissioned Ana Teresa Fernandez to do. <coughs> we invited her to Notre Dame to do an installation for the Dia de los Muertos. And we contracted her to do a painting and maybe a year and a half later or two, we were able to get this painting. The museum loved it so much that they used it as the primary uh, image for their ex exhibit. Let me go a little faster here. Uh, Chicago artist Juan Jose Gonzalez, who went to Notre Dame. I, I worked with him on my first time I ever worked on an art exhibit at, in, at Notre Dame. Esther Hernandez, uh, California-based artist. And so just rapidly going through Alan Romero from images from the collection, Delilah, uh, Jaime Guerrero, this is shown also. Uh, it's a full glass uh, sculpture. Most sculptures are like up to your waist or whatever, or, or just your face. A beautiful, beautiful glass work. He had a show at Notre Dame and were able to purchase that piece from him after the show was over. Uh, this piece was donated to uh, the National Museum of Mexican Art as well, Malakis Montoya. And then going toward the, the end of this part, we're, we're, here I'm showing work from in our collection as well, not, not just in the exhibitions. This is Cheech Marin at his home. Cheech and I are good friends. He's done a great job, big advocate for Latino art, the best advocate I think in the entire country. Uh, and he has helped establish the Cheech Marin uh, Center for Art in Riverside. Uh, we, he invited us to, to stay at his house. He's been in our house several times and we stayed for a week. And I'm proud to say that Cheech was our chauffeur for that week for Pacific Standard Time. And here's my wife, Dolores, in, in our old gallery space in South Bend. Uh, we were getting ready to move to Austin. Carmen Lomas Garza piece that I helped my co sponsor's publication or printing. I think there's an edition of maybe six, I forgot the number. Uh, these are metal plates. And, and here's work by Irene Perez that we commissioned that for a house that I built in Austin. Big piece of work, beautiful piece of work. She just visited and seen it for a number of years. Uh, she's originally from Venezuela, great artist. Delilah Montoya gave series of gifts to the uh, Snipe Museum of American Art a while back and also more recently. Um, that work was featured in the first show uh, here, Juan Sanchez is a piece that was done for Latino Art Now, which we helped organize. The first exhibit was done here in Austin, Texas. My wife at that time was still here at UT and helped organize that. Uh, Juan Sanchez later came to Notre Dame. We bought him for a visit and he got so impressed with the Basilica that he actually asked me to see if we'd do a mural. I was able to uh, get assistance from the university and the main entrance into the student center at the football stadium is a gigantic uh, mural that Juan created working involving Latino st students also for Notre Dame. Liliana Wilson, my wife, real close friends, we were able to commission her to do some work as well. And this one here's on immigrants. Connie uh, Ades Mendy, piece here. So this is just examples from the collection. And some of these examples, again, are now on migration again. Um, various artists, Victor Ochoa on the left and Shepard Ferry and Ernesto Irena um, piece, Felipe Edinburgh came to visit uh, and did a piece, this drawing, uh, watercolor drawing at our house. He also did the invitation for the Lotus and I's wedding. Um, Caspar Enriquez uh, was teaching in El Paso. He's retired now, has a studio there. Uh, this was featured in his one person, show of his work, his collection at the uh, El Paso Art Museum. Esperanza Gama, from, originally from Guadalajara, uh, lives in Chicago. We've done a lot of work together. Uh, we have a lot of her work. Jesus Benitez from El Paso originally did a lot, uh, a lot of photography in the border. He came to Notre Dame to study photography. And uh, he also went to Houston, uh, is now living in, um, in, in Europe with his girlfriend. Another piece by Elena. Uh, we contracted Federico Vigil to do some frescoes. This is his first fresco. We we'll still have to make a decision on the second and third smaller frescoes. Beautiful. This is a, he did the largest fresco I think ever, anywhere perhaps, when he did in the El Torreón at the National Hispanic uh, Cultural Center Museum. A wonderful artist. 
uh, in New Mexico, I'm sorry, yeah. Here, Sister Karen had Jose Montoya. I love that piece. I told Karen I'd like to buy it. She didn't want to sell it to me. She said, but when I pass away, you can have it, Gil. Well, fortunately, there are people who remember that. And unfortunately, she passed in 1997, a great friend, a great person who very inspiring and very committed to Latino art. And also passed to Ruben Trejo, uh, who became a very good friend. I used to visit him in Seattle and in Portland, when he lived in Portland. And he we gave him a show in South in, in, in at Notre Dame as well. Alan Romero, it's not a good image, sorry. This is donated to the Kellogg Institute at Notre Dame. Uh, Delilah Montoya wanted to do a series on Casas and we helped provide support. This is in our living room now. Marcelo Montoya, we've got a lot of his paintings that, he pur that we purchased a while back. Uh, Sandra Fernandez did a print for my 37th, oh no, 73rd birthday. Uh, my 70th birthday, excuse me. <laughs> for, uh, and she did a, a nice print that we gave to friends. Uh, Cheryl Sadi Garcia, who just got hired here at UT in the art department from Brooklyn, uh, Dominicana, and one of her pieces. I took a very bad image of that, but it's a beautiful piece. We have a lot of her work here as well. And then Diogenes Ballester, Puerto Rican artist. We actually invited to do work for uh, an installation and, and also an exhibition at the Notre Dame Center for Art and Culture. Uh, which I directed my last years at Notre Dame. Uh, and, and we featured uh, and honored Martin Luther King here. And then he uses images from the Puerto Rico and other things, the shoes of people migrating and walking and uh, who have disappeared. Beautiful, beautiful print. Uh, and then Later, we, we were invited again, uh, Amelia Malagam and myself, to help uh, the Colegio de la Frontera put together uh, some monoprints shows, uh, works for monoprints, since we had artists come up to South Bend to the, to the Jose Gouda studio uh, at the Notre Dame Center for Art and Culture. And they worked with these artists, five artists, or six artists. And then we also had in the Paul Press in Los Angeles do silk screens with artists as well. Here is some work done by Maria Tamasula, uh, some beautiful paintings or monoprints. She's a great printer, uh, as I mentioned her earlier, uh, fantastic uh, teacher at Notre Dame. So, and then later, a couple of years later, we were given a grant by the humanities uh, in the arts uh, in Illinois and to invite artists to do monoprints. And they came in from Omaha, Nebraska, from uh, St. Paul and, and Minneapolis, Minnesota, um, Columbus, Ohio, South Bend, and some artists from other parts in Chicago and other places. And so we did these talleres at the Segura studio. And here's Tina, an example of Tina Tavera in the global Midwest. Tina later uh, helped curate a show that went to Mexico City, drawing from the 2014 Taller de Monotipia and also from the one, the one, the most recent one I just, just described. Um, getting closing here, uh, the Blanton Museum of Art did a show, Art de Sin Fronteras, included works on migrant workers as well as many others from Self Help Graphics. Uh, of course, Carmen Ramos and her assistants uh, put the show together that you see now, uh, Printing the Revolution. Um, real proud of that exhibit. We donated artwork as well as other donors. Uh, Norma Iglesias put together a show at San Diego State University to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the Chicano Studies program there and did a wonderful catalog and exhibition. Unfortunately, the exhibition had to close because of the pandemic. Uh, and Pepe Coronado, uh, who I met here, was the first printer for, for Sam Coronado's studio, Sam Pass, as you know, uh, very, very sad, uh, great printmaker. And Pepe is a wonderful printmaker. He left Austin uh, and went to Washington and then went to New York and had print studios in both places. And this is the piece that Juan has uh, donated to the, and I'm real happy to see that when I saw the show uh, and we have that in our collection as well. But the, this is remind me of a lot of people who have passed already, artists who have done great work and hopefully will continue to be recognized in ways that they should be. Uh, this is the last print I wanna show you, which is uh, Luis Jimenez illegals done in 1985 
This is in one's collection. I'm jealous. I wish I had this print. Never were able to purchase it. I'm so glad that Juan has the print and donated to Mexicarte and that it's on view now. So again, I really hope that you have a chance to visit and see the exhibition. And again, very grateful to Mexicarte for putting the show together. Gracias. All right. Awesome. So very insightful. We're going to start taking questions now for from both our Facebook Live and our participants here on the Zoom. So if you guys have any questions for either Dr. Gil Cardenas, Vargas, um, we will be taking those now. We have one from Luz Molina that says, thank you for sharing insights specific to Mexican migration. Can you please speak about the Bracero program? Yes, there's a, let me begin by telling you that in 1917, there's a, a 1920 wall law uh, enabled the, no, a law passed in 1917 enabled the temporary admission of Mexican migrants to work in the United States. This is during World War I, a shortage of labor in labor intensive industries and agriculture, mining and other places. And that was the first mass migration from Mexico to the United States. Mexican Revolution caused some migration, but the largest mass migration from Mexico developed at that time. It was temporary. Uh, believe it or not, when we uncovered records in the National Archives, which I did for the very first time became public after the entire immigration records from the 1910s to about 1954, and became public after that, but it showed that the Navy Department had information about the interior, who came from what place in the interior of Mexico, where they went, who they worked for, and how much they made. That's how much information they had at that time, according to these government records. People were killed coming from China in Mexico and, and also in South Texas where people were massacred for fear that the immigrants had killed uh, some, a horse or a cow or something. And the whole male village or the, all the males were, were adult males were, were assassinated. Uh, and this, this the intelligence agency was, com was complaining to his supervisors in Washington about this happening and nothing being, no response to it. Uh, a lot of things happened in that kind of thing. So then I, that was the first importation program. Later in World War II, there were efforts to, to, to do a new importation program. Uh, the first one, Mexico was not involved as a unilateral decision. And the second one is a binational treaty agreement. And then it continued on, uh, it ended at a certain point, but continued informally and then resurrected again in 1952 and continued into the mid 1960s. And that was the Bracero program. Again, temporary workers coming in, uh, many of them had formerly been undocumented. Uh, they were badly mistreated also by the Mexican government, uh, sometimes by employers, but at least were able to make money and feed their families. But it continued this idea of place of residence in Mexico and work in the US and dependency of the employers to use these workers and dependency of these workers to have jobs in the United States. So when this program ends, they still have the same needs. They still have to feed the same families, the workers, the employers still need these workers. So they come up to work and the underground system gets stronger. We criminalize migration more. We drive that underground system. It's more necessary to the whole process and it becomes institutionalized, becomes an international system of living and working. And then we criminalize it and make it illegal and then blame these immigrants for causing that problem, which they didn't cause. But they're the ones, again, that get attacked and get scapegoated and are blamed for that. Um, again, we prefer temporary workers when not Mexicans coming in legally and permanently. Now that happened at different points in time. Where one time during the late 20s, Mexicans were the leading country of immigration because of the discretionary authority of the State Department. But later, almost no Mexicans came in during the beginning part of the Great Depression. And they were not given permission to enter the United States legally or permanently. Uh, so the Veracero program had a big impact in, again, creating this division between place of work and place of, of labor. So this, when you have a high level, high demand, high use, you also have a high level of profitability, especially if they're undocumented. So that became the preferred labor force for many industries throughout the United States. Uh, we have another one from Anonymous that says, what is the difference in identity between a Mexican and 
a Chicano Chicana. What is the authentic meaning of Chicana or Chicano, uh, not just an immigrant from Mexico? That's, that's right, that, that's complicated. Uh, we have a, a variety of definitions. I used to use Chicano and that was telling us that you know we're Mexican by use of that term Chicano in our in our minds. Um, and some people try to make a connection between its origins being in Mexico, that may be true, I don't know. Uh, but that became a preferred term for many of us. My grandmother, mi abuela, didn't like that term. She liked Mexicana. Uh, she was always Mexican, even though she lived in the United States. Um, we see, I've used the term Latino more than anything now. I, I don't know that they're, that they're one or the other. I, I, I interchange and use them all. Um, so I, it's, as long as there are terms that we are labeling ourselves with, not others, that's the most, for me, that's the most important thing, our own self-identity. And then Mexicans who migrate to the United States continue to have their identity as Mexicano. And in time, their children will take Mexican-American or Chicano or Latino or anything else like that. Um, so I think it's, it's very variable. There's no absolute definition. But uh, the most important part, I think, is just the connection that people are making across borders, across boundaries uh, with each other in terms of the United States, uh, Dominicanos, Puerto Rican, Chicanos, you name it. We can call ourselves Latino. I know there's a lot of sometimes that makes people, Dominicanos, for example, be erased because they're more recent and they're really trying to keep their identity here in the US. Sometimes they're not recognized the Dominican Republic. We're given this as, as Dominican anymore, even though they're born and raised in the Dominican Republic, but now they live in New York and they're doing work in New York. Um, so there's a variety, a mix of, of factors that intercede on that situation. Got one from Leo Valdez. It says, thank you for sharing today and for making art accessible for many of us. What changes have you seen in the art world which has either opened or hindered Latinx artists from reaching a broader audience? There have been many changes. And let me start with ourselves. You know, back in the 60s and 70s and to the present, which I'm very grateful and very hope it continues, is that this art has, has been a lot of political art, activists doing work, addressing our community, making work available to our community and its affordability, addressing issues where they can affirm their culture or also help direct attention to condemning discrimination and segregation and injustice, things of that sort. But one thing we didn't recognize as much during that time, a lot of artists that were not doing that were also producing work that's getting more attention today. Um, a lot of female artists, Latinas artwork, even though they're progressive and active, we're not getting as much attention as they should have been. And there's more attention now to that. We see a lot more uh, recognition because people being active uh, with museums. Uh, a lot of museums like the Blanton Museum, uh, really paying attention, the Museo de Barrio in New York, you know, we have spaces that, that are developing and or, or art spaces that have been there for a while. We're addressing the issue seriously with curatorial staff and other ways outreach. Uh, the Smithsonian, I was fortunate to be invited to be part of a, of a um, com committee to look at the situation at the Smithsonian. Uh, we issued a report in 1994 that included calling for the establishment of a national museum for, for Latinos. Uh, this has progressed. I'm really grateful that uh, I, I got on the commission to look at the feasibility of a Latino museum uh, and our report in 1910, I believe, I'm sorry, 2010, <laughs> uh, called for, for establishing a museum at the Smithsonian. Um, we're very happy to be part of that. And then later, um, Others have really pushed that and they were able to get the legislation passed for that. So hopefully in our, before we pass, we'll be able to see a museum in Washington. Uh, so there's a lot of activities going on. Uh, some museums will begin to collect this work. I've been donating my work to museums with the exception of a few times. Uh, the overwhelming majority of several thousand works that we've donated have been to museums and to Latino organizations throughout the country uh, in support of the artists. The artists have been very generous with me over the years. We've done a lot of projects together. I wanna to see Puerto Rican artists here in Texas. I wanna see Texas Tejano artists in New York. I wanna see Mexican artists from Chicago here in the Blanton Museum and LA artists at the Blanton Museum and artists at the National 
Hispanic Cultural Center Museum. So that's my goal. Chich Marin has a different approach. He says, Gil, museums buy art, they should buy Chicano art too. And which I fully agree with them. I think both are needed. So I'm trying to whet their appetites. Most, you know, I give paintings too, but most of the work I give are fine art prints, uh, not only, but in drawings and photographs, things of that sort. Uh, Cheech says, no, they need to buy artwork too from, from us. So I think both are very necessary. And so that helps expand the availability and the presence of Latino art in these museums uh, and in other public spaces. I hope I answered the question. Uh, are you interested in collecting NFT artworks into your collection? NFT museum. So, and this is from M and M on uh, initials, and I guess NFTs are. It's like this new, like now that so much so much digital work is being created. Oh, okay, uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's like digital work that's kind of blockchains. Like, like it's it's an it's a digital image, and how can you claim to have the original? So now this like kind of like Bitcoin, uh, right. so you have the original, even though it's being like reproduced online. You still pay thousands. People are paying thousands of dollars just for the original blockchain. Right. Well, you know, you see the work of Machaca, for example, he's doing some really beautiful work. Um, I see video work that he's created in other artists. Uh, I've seen work. Uh, the very creative work that's been done so at the Smithsonian, uh, here at the Blanta Museum, I'm sorry, at the Austin Museum of Art years back when I was still here. Um, Fernando Salicrup did a lot of digital work, one of the pioneers uh, in the, with the Taya Boricua. Uh, I have a big collection of his work. All that I think is very important. I mean, they're, they're getting the message across, they're telling the story. They're reflecting on our past, they're talking about our present, they're talking about the future, and they're doing it in very creative ways. And I think that's all good. Um, I prefer other kinds of work. In, in terms, well, I shouldn't say I prefer it. I, I have a bigger collection of other works, lithographs, etchings, et cetera. But I appreciate what these artists are doing and the skill that they're taking, the time that they're taking to do this work. Um, so I'm not an expert in this area. It's, it's much more recent, uh, but I, uh, I, I do appreciate it. And thank the artists for getting skills in this. Awesome. And our last question from Javier Morin says, do you find that artists tend to stick with a certain style or theme across time? Or do you see the theme change as political situations change in the US-Mexico relations? I refer to looking at the body of work of individual artists across time. Um, yeah. Yep. You know, so I think so many artists pretty much stay with the same kind of style and technique. Other artists, uh, have, have changed in time um, in terms of what they're focusing on. Uh, I think there's a greater number of artists who are working a variety of, of, of attention to a variety of ways to, to create work. Uh, they're not necessarily uh, strictly culturally based. They are and they're not. I mean, they're, they're not openly that way, but they're still in, in, locked into their images. There's a lot of culture, uh, but their goal isn't to to really a firm culture in a front way, but really inside. So if you look at it carefully, you know about art and you hear from the artists, you might be able to read what they're doing and it tells a really great story once they explain it to you. Sometimes you can't see it visually. Um, I don't know if I have a right answer for that. Uh, I wish I could tell you yes or no, but it's, I think many artists have changed over the years. I'm glad, for example, that Malakis Montoya has really stayed to the idea of affirming culture or condemning and, and trying to bring notices to our community uh, about the need for action uh, and the concern that we should have for each other. You know, we're a class-based society and we're not exempt from that. Uh, Latinos are not exempt from that part either. And we have to stay in solidarity with the people who have great needs, immigrants, poor people, working class people, you know, and we should support uh, and lobby for the working class. The majority do that, the people in power do that. They hire lobbyists, et cetera, to support their interests. Okay, fine. Well, we should do that too as a majority of people, working class people. So blacks, Latinos, poor whites, Asians, et cetera. 
who are working class, whether low working class or high working class, we still have to earn salaries or money or wages. So together we have some commonality of interest. And for that reason, you know, we need to press on and have these artists, as many as we can get to do this, to continue supporting, uh, bringing messages to the people uh, through art and through visual ways, through murals and public art as well, and through performances and presentations. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. And Dr. George Vargas, any closing statements? Yes, thank you, Dr. Cardenas. That was a fascinating lecture. That was great. I appreciate it. Thank you. We will now close the program and invite you to hear our fourth lecture, Dr. Sara Lopez, April 17th, Saturday, 11 o'clock in the morning, who will speak on immigrant dream and nightmare, Mexican mobility in perspective, building futures, closing pathways. On that note, we say goodbye. Adiós.